afternoon to you and welcome. Um, I'm Deborah Rodriguez. I'm the marketing manager here at CV, and I just have a couple of quick announcements and housekeeping things to take care of before I turn this over to our speakers. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for joining us. It's it's a uh, it's it's a, an honor for you, for us to to have this time with you. We know that you're busy, so we will keep it quick and and we'll try to keep it very focused and informative. Um, we are repeating this session two more times. It'll be uh, again today at 11 a.m. Eastern Time and tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we're recording this session, so uh, we can archive it on our zv.com Smart Buy website. You're welcome to view it there and share it with your colleagues. Just a quick note about what Smart Buy is. It's a portal that we have for our dealers and distributors. So our intention is that we can um, partner with you better if we give you the tools to, um, that you need in order to do a ZV business. So um, there is where we will archive our webinars and you can have access to our, um, our literature, our brochures, um, pictures of our products, that kind of thing. So um, we urge you to, to log in, check it out. Again, it's zv.com slash smartbuy, all one word. Put that up at the end of the, the program so you can write it down. Also, um, we will be giving you a copy of the presentation when this is all over. So if you want to be able to refer to it again and you want to share it with your colleagues, we welcome you to do that. We do have a large audience today, so we're not going to open the floor um, so that you can ask your questions audibly. We're going to ask you to use the, the panel on your the right-hand side of your screen where there's a, there's a question area. So you type your questions, and we'll take them as they come in. We are also having a uh, Q&A period at the end of the session, so we'll try to get all of your questions covered before this is over. However, if you do have some questions that we didn't answer in the session or that you would like to, um, you would like to follow up with, you can email me and I will forward your questions on to the right person. You can email me at marketing at zb.com. That's, again, marketing at cv.com. And, again, um, we'll put that up uh, at the end of the session so, you, so you'll so you have it. And, finally, I'd like to introduce, introduce you today to our speakers. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Bill Robertson. He's our VP of Development uh, at Digital, I'm, I'm sorry, Monroe Electronics. And um, he has 10 years of experience in emergency alert systems. He's really a seasoned veteran and knows his stuff. So with this, it's a real pleasure to welcome Bill today. We also have Melanie Rodriguez. She's our director of tech support. And she is so good at helping people figure out the answers to their questions that she even gets calls from people that, with questions about other people's products. She's that good. So with that, um, I'll introduce Chris Curdo. He's our vice president of North American Sales. He is a true veteran of the industry, and in general, he's just a really smart guy. So we'll start off with Chris. Um, take it away, Chris. Great. Thanks, Deb. And I also want to thank you all for attending uh, either this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are. We do realize your time is valuable, and we're very excited about some of the features that we have been building into our products and have been working hard with uh, companies like Monroe Electronics to make sure that we're getting it right, and we're, we're building features that are valuable. So with that, we'll start this morning. So at ZB, um, over the last couple of years, I think you've seen us begin to really pack a lot of valuable features inside our boxes and inside our units. And one of those features that really came to bear as we gained more experience in the, in the space of digital encoding and modulation and also began to work much more closely with our dealers was that emergency alert was being asked by their customers. And there's more and more, really based on segments. And there were a couple very um, focused segments that started with, and I'll tell you that it started in the academic and institutions world where student housing became a, a really big market uh, for products like ours as people really tried to diversify and move away from the cable company and begin to offer their own customized program to universities and large student housing providers. And one of the things that became very important to them was an ability to immediately talk to the students. You're going to hear a lot of, about other ways to communicate with uh, 
viewers or people in general about emergency situations. And what we ran into was universities needed something that was almost instantaneous or was very, very close to instantaneous. And so we started to partner and search for results and, and found Monroe and really started to work with them on incorporating that type of capability. You know, more and more today we're reading about just horrific things happening in the news where emergency alert and instantaneous awareness becomes very, very vital to not only people's safety, but sometimes their actual survival. We see it in corporate centers. We're certainly seeing it in hospitals or the requirement to have this in hospitals. Um, hospitals use it in a lot of different ways, not just for things like weather or danger. They're alerting patients to lockdown situations uh, and, and environments like that. Certainly uh, airports, bus stations, trains, um, ferries overseas, we see the need to create some emergency alert capability on some of these larger ferries as they are you know, making their way in, in rough seas. Um, we're getting more and more requirements, more and more questions about how do they do that. Certainly uh, multiple dwelling units. So we look at apartments, we look at condominiums in North America, and you look at some of the larger um, buildings in, in Europe, and, and you run into the same thing. Stadiums and arenas, uh, soccer stadiums, large rugby stadiums, uh, large football stadiums in the United States, these are places where people are gathering in the you know hundreds of thousands these days, certainly tens of thousands, and they need some means to communicate with these people instantaneously. Um, you know, senior retirement living also, and uh, you know the last one that I didn't even think about was RV parks in the U.S. So recreational vehicle parks, where people are coming to vacation, they're coming to stay for months on end if they happen to be what we refer to as snowbirds, somebody living on the north side of the country during fair weather. They're moving to the south side of the country during uh, inclement weather, and they, you know, they're looking for a way to communicate with their temporary residents without having some sort of registration. Obviously, the the first thing that comes to mind and the most ubiquitous in the United States and in North America is the television. So that is, those are the markets that we've seen develop for this product and the need coming forth. And to be perfectly honest, I would tell you that we have built this capability into the product. We see end users acquiring it of the people quoting the project, but we're seeing you know very little uptake in terms of actual implementation. We started to see a lot more in the last six to nine months, but before that it was just there wasn't much uptake. They make it a requirement, they build it into the spec. Now we're starting to see them actually use it, which is you know great to see when you've taken the time to build stuff like this in. So with that, um, kind of as the groundwork. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Bill, and there you go, Bill. You should, I think Melanie will give you control, and you should have it. So thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Deb. Appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, speak on behalf of uh, kind of the uh, state of uh, EAS and emergency alerting. Uh, let's see if I've got control here. We'll take it into the next slide. Um, one of the things that Chris kind of pointed out already is a little bit about the uh, the general idea of public alerting. And really the goal of any type of public alerting is to reduce different types of effects. It's going to be different events that are happening, storms, earthquakes, different types of emergencies. And these can have a whole number or a range of different impacts on obviously different people. Um, but the idea of communicating and letting people know what to do and what they need to really pay attention to can really help reduce all types of things, life, limb, property damage, different areas that they have to focus on. Also, when you have an audience and you're giving them information, you build up a trust. You build up a relationship with that viewer. Hey, I can watch this channel. Everybody kind of knows they watch uh, certain channels for certain types of emergencies or, or more information. And much the same way you can have a respect saying, hey, I know that if something happens, these people will let me know what's going on. They'll give me information, and they'll let me understand what I need to do. One thing about it from our perspective here, too, as a group of individuals that are focused on this, is providing these types of alerts can also provide an additional income source for integrators. If people have a distribution system in place, you can come back to them and say, hey, you know, taking into account how important public alerting is, you can add this to your, your kit, if you will, 
and offer the opportunity to inform these people. And I think many times the people that are responsible for this type of system uh, as have already provided it, recognizing that they can add public alerting and warning to it, uh, really presents a very nice opportunity. One of the things I want to take you through is when we talk about the importance of public alerting, let's talk a little bit about uh, more of the technology side of public alerting. We're not going to go all the way back to the old town crier uh, in the middle of the, of the city trying to uh, communicate or even the, the timeliness of it. We're talking about very timely, very specific uh, alerting thing. In the United States, this actually goes back to uh, the early 50s, which what was known as Conrad. This really was a uh, way in which the civil defense uh, organization would communicate to the public at large primarily by means of radio. Again, when we're thinking about large-scale public alerting, we're talking about uh, elements of what we could do. So it really was kind of a broadcast mode thing. And Connell Rad was the first start of this. If you can kind of think about it, this was during kind of the early days of the Cold War, but they needed some way to communicate to the public if there was crisis information. Later on, it grew into what we for, refer to as the EBS or emergency broadcast system. And this actually ran for a long period of time. As you can see, from 1963 to 97, EBS was the same thing. You'd get you know, tones on the TV. You would look or listen for information if there was some type of emergency to know what was going on. But recognize we've gone from combat being a radio-only based system to now EBS, which was radio and television. If you're talking about, you know, even into the uh, uh, early 80s and things like that, television was primarily a broadcast medium. It really didn't focus on cable or a lot of closed circuit television. It was a broadcast medium. We had you know, just a few network broadcast stations in the United States. That's how they did it. Coming up in 1997 and moving on through even today, we have something that's called EAS, or Emergency Alert System. This now encompasses even more refined areas of communication, meaning not just radio, not just television, but now we're getting into CATV or cable television. We're getting into IPTV and systems that have more and more viewerships associated with kind of niche types of things so that you can go, not everybody is you know, monitoring as we did in the EBS days or you know, watching NBC, ABC or some of the, the primary networks. You're now looking at very, very refined and specific, you know, specific networks. You're watching uh, a, a particular channel, a cartoon network. It could be anything. But you have to be able to communicate to those people also. So you're kind of narrowing from a broadcast into a narrow cast field. And most recently, the introduction of what is referred to as IPOS or CAP messaging, and CAP stands for Common Alert Protocol, is another mechanism where we can use a singular message that is constructed by the alerting authorities to be able to communicate not only to broadcast, but also wireless devices like telephones, cellular telephones. So again, someone can see the evolution going from a radio-based system here all the way through to te radio and television, radio, television, and cable, and now we're getting down radio, television, cable, and even down to handheld devices. So the evolution of public alerting is focusing even more and more to being able to make sure we can get all those people. They're not all watching the same channel. They're not all you know, necessarily watching TV in some respects. We want to be able to communicate with them, and that's an important consideration when we're doing this. So part of the way in which these messages are gathered and uh, really aggregated into a central point, there are a number of different uh, alerting agencies. These are uh, emergency operation centers. These are uh, individuals at the state, the federal level, um, and even local counties and communities that are responsible for communicating emergency information. Now, this information would be things like tornadoes. It could be weather-related. It could be you know, fires, floods, any of those types of things. And it's an interesting web of interconnections between different sources. And our responsibility on the Monroe side is to use our particular device to gather this information. We're listening, constantly monitoring the different sources that are possibly going to send out emergency information. Now, many times you end up with weather emergencies or weather that is just constantly updating weather information. And our box listens and monitors this information. When it reaches a certain level or a threshold, then we in turn will forward that out. 
Now, this looks like kind of a, an interesting, as I said, web of, of different devices, and it's all interconnected between this and that. But really, it boils down to something quite simple from our perspective when we're integrating these things. Very simply, you hook up external antennas, and this monitors what we refer to as legacy EAS. This is coming over the radio. It's communicated by the federal uh, authorities here in the United States and, and other locations, and it communicates emergency information over uh, radio transmissions. The second way is transmissions that come by way of CAP servers, again, that common alert protocol, and those come by way of an internet or some kind of data feed. So really you have kind of a real simple connection. You've got antennas for the legacy EAS, you've got an internet connection for the CAP servers. All of that stuff is aggregated and then we pass that information into the ZV distribution system. So it makes it very simple, very straightforward to be able to do that. Now, one thing that we've done is working with ZV, we integrate our system, our OneNet device, using what we refer to as EASnet. This allows us to transfer the messages over an IP interface. Now, the nice thing about using an IP interface, it makes it very, very straightforward because we're able to send the information to the ZV device as, as a client. And that creates the alert text and any associated audio that might be uh, part of that particular emergency communication, if they're going to give you instructions on what to do, where to go, types of things. Since EASnet supplies both the text and audio to any of the connected devices, what's very nice is the ZV devices feature a unique capability of grabbing this EASnet uh, transmission and relaying it to all of the devices in their particular uh, distribution chain. So what's nice is you really end up with a simple, if you will, one wire or Ethernet connection from our device to be able to handle all of the information through ZV distribution. So when you look at this in kind of a, a, a little simple map, if you will, it's our one that is listening to all of those uh, sources, the radios and, and the uh, CAP Internet types of things to be able to get information. When it reaches the threat, we'll send that into a uh, output to the to a, a uh, Ethernet switch into the combining network and that goes very simply connected to the ZV encoders. So again, these devices are listening and they will recognize an EAS net transmission into them and then of course out of that into the combining network and onward to all the displays. So it makes it a very straightforward thing. I know Melanie's going to talk a little bit more about this, but you can see it's a very simple way to connect these devices which are typically connected anyway. Um, by way of the maestro and the control system that uh, ZV has. So you've got a very nice and very simple way in which these things can be connected. So again, if you look at kind of the, the, a different wiring uh, diagram here for the output with all the different satellite receivers and different input sources, you now have a connection from the one net into those things and out to all the different TVs. So one of the things when you see a alert that pops up, what you have is a full screen display. So you might be typically, you know, watching it as an example here of the soccer game, but when the video and audio, we replace it. We, we take the, and drop the, uh, the video and the audio that you would be currently seeing and you would be replaced with a full screen display. If there are multiple pages of information, they are sequenced. In other words, you can, and sometimes the you know, alerts could be very long in their text or the information that they want to display. And it's important to kind of sequence through those. So the pages are timed and sequenced that you have that. And then they'll continue based on a configuration parameter. In other words, how long is the event? Uh, what's the duration? And so the pages will sequence through until the alert is even over or after a certain period of time. This system makes it very easy to deploy. Uh, some people look at different ways to display it, but when you do this type of thing, especially when it's integrated with the ZV uh, equipment, it's a very simple way to do it. And most importantly, it communicates the emergency information that we need to on a very, very timely basis. So really, if we look at it from our perspective, adding emergency messaging can really have an impact. Number one, it saves lives, and that's an important thing. You can have property, and really, this is another area that a lot of people don't recognize, is kind of a reduction in injury and liability. Oh, I wasn't told what to do. Well, if you tell people what to do, what not to do, don't go here or things like that, where to go, and give them the information, that's what's critical. And you can reduce a lot of impact or, or negative impact, if you will, uh, by giving them that type of information. 
Also, as we said before, building the trust and targeting alerts so that you understand what's going on. We don't need to alert everybody. We need to get people that are going to be impacted. We need to get them the information. So on a regional basis where we've got weather and floods that might cover a, a large regional area, also down to local. And in, with the ZV equipment, you've got the ability to do hyper-local where you can be very, very refined on uh, just that specific building, just that specific arena, those types of things which make it very, very nice to be able to communicate in a very timely manner. Again, proper and timely instructions to the people that need it most. And as I indicated before, you have an opportunity to upsell and to reach customers. Go back to them and say, hey, look, we can add this type of equipment. It makes it nice. And here's some of the reasons why it's important to you and something you should really consider and think about. So really, when you look at that and, and being able to work with CV and the implementation it makes it very straightforward. Again, simple, single IP interface, hook up the antennas and the radios, so a couple of parameters set up on our side, and you've got now federal level, state level, local level emergency information that you're able to bridge into the environment, the distribution environment with it. So I'll turn it over now to Melanie. Thank you very much. Melanie, it's, it's yours. Bill, this is Deborah. Um, before you head out, um, we have a quick question from John who would like to know if there's a similar system to EAS and CAP in uh, the UK and Europe. Um, there isn't yet. In fact, it's starting to expand. We're doing more stuff. And if you can imagine, uh, countries like Lithuania uh, has it. Uh, Canada is coming on board. Several uh, nations are starting to understand the impact of this. In the United States, again, we started off with the legacy EAS. That's you know going back again to the radio, Conrad type of thing. And it's becoming much more prevalent. There are places that, although it may not be supported by a uh, a governmental type of thing, you can still implement a lot of the functions at a local level and uh, even at a regional level because there, some of the municipalities might have uh, their own local CAP servers. Uh, here in the United States, it was mandated by federal law, um, but I think we're seeing a lot more interest. Uh, again, you know, a number of countries, uh, the Caribbean Islands, another one uh, example that have now implemented this at a large uh, scale. Uh, Thing. So it's not specific to, uh, to some of the countries yet, but I think that we're going to start seeing, again, the prominence of it, the importance of it. We're going to see it start to uh, roll out in a, in a larger way. Great. Thank you. That's the only question that we got for you, Bill. Good job. Great. Thanks. Okay. I'll stand by. Well, this is Melanie here. Uh, again, I head up the tech support group at ZV. So what we're going to uh, jump through next is just some of the more ZV-specific information. Uh, what I want to talk about, which Bill has already sort of alluded to, is this local alert concept. Within our Meister tool, which is the management tool for the, the ZV modulators, you can send a local uh, alert through all of the channels that are being sent from the, the ZB products. You can specify um, text that you can enter. You can actually upload an optional audio file to play it and then um, specify how long the alert should run. So this is all um, not something that's going to be generated from the Monroe box. It's a, a manual process. Uh, I've got a screenshot here from within Maestro. At the top, there's a Send Emergency Alert button. So if you click on that, you can see it gives you a little pop-up where you can enter the text add a file, uh, an audio file if you'd like, and then set your duration and send the alert. Now, any units that are being managed uh, while you send this alert are then going to stop the video that is being played and send this text information out to all of the screens. So this is a, that, that hyper-local alert that Bill was talking about where it's going to be very specific to just the location. Again, this is through the, the Maestro tool. And then uh, once we sort of move away from that and we start talking about the, the communication with the Monroe OneNet piece, there are three different options that we actually offer through uh, our Maestro tool and through our setup with Monroe. The one uh, that Bill has already talked about is the EAS net. And this is what I have worked with the most customers on to date. Um, this is going to be the EAS net specific. Uh, the alert is sent to the units via that Ethernet, and it has a specific start and stop time for the message. So when we get it in, we know we started at, you know, either immediately or at a specific time. And then after a certain amount of time has gone by, we stop it. Um, 
The one piece of information that's really important for this is that both the our unit and the OneNet from Monroe must have an NTP server, which is a network time server specified, so that the time period matches on both sides. Otherwise, uh, you can have a message that doesn't go as long as it's supposed to, or what I've actually run into more recently is a message that never ends because the time is so different on the two units that it's going to take years for us to actually catch up and hit the end of that message. Uh, so I like to point that out. It's the, the biggest issue we run into when setting up EASnet with our gear is that, that NTP server. The other two options we have are, are very similar. It's going to be MPEG-2 streaming. So from Monroe OneNet, we actually get an MPEG-2 stream. There is no NTP required here because the, the streaming starts and then it stops. And we switch on when the streaming starts and switch off when the streaming stops. Um, there's a unicast option, which is going to be a one-to-one -one versus a uh, MCAST or multicast, which is going to be a one-to-many. Uh, so they, they, they work essentially the same way. It's just simply the matter of how many um, IP addresses you're going to be sending that streaming information to. Take a look at the MISER configuration again for EAS in general. We're logged in. We're on the device tab. And then with advanced controls checked, which is always down in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see over on the left-hand side you actually get the EAS options. And here by default, disabled is what it's going to be set for. We don't have any EAS set up um, automatically. Now, it should be noted that this EAS mode is strictly for the Monroe. The send emergency alert, the local alert, is always available. You don't have to enable anything special. You simply have to click on the button and move forward. Um, but to, to set up the, the, the um, the Monroe side of things, you need to specify whether you're going to use the EASnet or the MPEG-2 and enter some other configuration. And it's going to be specific depending upon whether you're using EASnet, MPEG-2, or MCAST. We have a, an application note on our website that walks through every single configuration piece, both on the Monroe side as well as on our side, that needs to be set when you're setting up EAS. So if this is something you're going to walk through, I strongly recommend downloading that PDF and walking through that with your setup. Once you've selected it and saved your changes, you then also need to make configurations, as both Bill and I have talked about, on the Monroe side of things, on the, the EAS net or MPEG, to specify the IP addresses so that the communication happens between the two pieces of gear, and we can get those alert and send them out to the TVs. This slide should look a little bit, uh, should look very similar. I stole it actually from Bill because it's a great slide. It shows the one net piece connected into the same IP switch that our units are connected to. Um, the one piece that's added here is that NTP server access. This is specifically again for the EAS net because we need to make sure the time on the one net as well as the uh, ZB gear is exactly the same. From there, we are able to communicate with the Monroe Net, get that information, and send it out to the TV. So a very simple networking um, setup from that standpoint. The next slide is essentially, it's actually exactly the same one that Bill had previously. This would be for MPEG. You don't need to worry about that NTP server, uh, but you do need to still have that communication via the same uh, IP switch to be able to, to talk between the two and for us to get that streaming information. And that's the end of the ZV side. Deb, do we have any questions? I don't see any questions at this point. Um, if there's anyone who's got some burning questions that come up in your, in your mind after the session is over, then I welcome you to email me at marketing at zv.com, and um, I'll be happy to forward your question to the correct person, assuming I myself don't have the answer. Um, thank you for the feedback that I'm seeing that uh, that uh, our speakers did a great job. I have to agree. I think they, they did. Melanie, if you could pre uh, advance the slide one more time. The information that uh, I was talking about before is there. So again, we have additional sessions. We will be archiving this at zv.com slash smartbuy. Again, smartbuy is our dealer and distributor portal. Lots of great material there for you. and. Um, your questions and follow-up, you can address that at to marketing at zv.com. If it's a sales-specific question, you're welcome to email sales at zv.com. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today.